you, uh, Carol, for that uh, lovely introduction. I appreciate that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here with you today. So thank you uh, once again for uh, having me here uh, today to talk to you about uh, historic uh, site sustainability. Uh, we at uh, Dumbarton House uh, embarked upon uh, the uh, idea of sustainability as part of our general operations and uh, uh, process. Uh, really back when I first started uh, volunteering uh, at Dumbarton House. Um, I started volunteering at Dumbarton House in the fall of 2009 and uh, uh, came on board as an employee in 2013. It was in that uh, year, 2013, uh, that um, uh, the board adopted a, a sustainability action plan uh, for Dumbarton House. Let me talk a little bit about uh, historic preservation and uh, sustainability and how they are interconnected. As people interested in historic house museums, we are, of course, interested in historic preservation. The museums can't exist and couldn't survive for any length of time without us being interested in that. Historic preservation is a crucial part in creating sustainable environments and buildings. Preservation is about preserving the past for the future. Sustainability is about making sure what we have available to us now is around for future generations. An interesting thought, buildings constructed before 1920 are generally more energy efficient, provided they're taken care of, than those built between 1920 and 2000. I think that's a clear indicator that preservation and sustainability are inherent partners. Transportation accounts for 29% of America's carbon emissions. It's estimated that some 80% of all goods are carried by sea and container ships. That's 80% of everything we wear, tools we use, food we eat, all goods. Approximately 70% of all solid municipal waste created in the United States is construction and demolition uh, waste. That's something to think about too, right? Not just how much of the stuff that we get, whether we're selling them in our gift shops, whether we're buying them in our stores, 80% of those are on shipping containers, 70% of the waste when you municipal, in municipal uh, uh, areas is construction and demolition uh, waste. It is estimated that 30% of America's carbon emissions come from the operation of buildings. All of these hit upon the work that we do in historic preservation and historic uh, house museums uh, across this country. Transportation, building operations, and construction. Those are the things that uh, impact every aspect uh, that we do uh, in our various historic sites. Sustainability isn't a new concept. It dates back certainly to uh, uh, from uh, Western history to Aristotle. Uh, his definition is a little different than how we uh, look at it today. Certainly today, uh, our understanding uh, grew out of the environmental awareness campaigns of the 60s and 70s. But it's in 1987 when the United Nations comes up with the following de uh, definition for sustainable development. Development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's sustainable development. Making sure that what we do is done in a way that meets our needs without imposing restrictions upon those who follow us. Sustainability is shifting away from abstract concepts to concrete steps that we can do and plan for each year uh, to know that we are um, uh, approaching our work in the most effective manner. Historic um, practices uh, with respect to uh, sustainability, we must be thoughtful about everything we, uh, uh, or excuse, historically, people were very thoughtful about everything they did with respect to cost and time. Most practices historically have been about heating and cooling. And today, as I've showed with some of the uh, figures, today, most of our energy is used 
for heating and cooling or transportation. Historically, people relied heavily on the design methods of, of uh, buildings and windows, uh, lighting, human systems, and the environment around them to sustain fuel consumption, lower their costs, and provide comfort for themselves. Now, you'll uh, excuse me if I go uh, uh, just a little bit uh, uh, into uh, history here. Uh, I think we'll all uh, enjoy that. That's uh, what uh, drives many of uh, our interests here uh, uh, in the world in which we work. Uh, let's look at some of the ways historically uh, people have tried to approach um, various operations within their homes uh, and how they made use of uh, uh, natural sources uh, in order to achieve certain uh, results. They maximize natural uh, sources uh, for uh, heating, lighting, and ventilation, thick solid walls, uh, masonry walls for many of the structures that we uh, oversee, reduce the amount of energy needed for heating and cooling. Uh, it not only just was a structural element to hold up uh, the, some of these uh, larger structures, but it actually served a uh, very specific uh, need. Long center passageways uh, with doors on either side uh, were design features that uh, allowed uh, um, uh, the movement of air uh, through the rooms. Um, closed in the wintertime to reduce drafts, uh, providing that ventilation uh, in the summer. Transoms, high ceilings, big operable windows, uh, again, allowing for that movement of air uh, naturally uh, through, uh, through these buildings. Controlled light through the use of shades and blinds. They aren't just uh, beautiful things, although that aesthetic is, uh, is part of the shades and blinds, right? But they also controlled heat transfer, controlled light, uh, windows that open as opposed to windows that were fixed help circulate air and regulate interior temperatures. During the fall, leaks uh, around windows and doors were sealed by uh, papering or pasting or covering with some sort of base. Leather stripping was often used to around doors and windows. Wood shutters provided natural light when open and keep interior cool when closed. Something we actually still do today at Dumbarton House uh, with our wood shutters. Lighting for uh, people in the past was more specific than it generally is today. They lighted uh, tasks, not rooms, uh, desk lamps and uh, individual candles. Uh, families gathered around one light in the evening. Light candles only lamps only when needed. Light oil lamps on streets only when we had moonless nights. All in an effort to conserve uh, and um, keep uh, the cost down on supplying uh, light, uh, both domestically, but also uh, commercially. Maximize light from candles by hanging reflectors on the walls. Uh, certainly uh, mirrored rooms are lovely things to look at, but they served an additional function. Um, glass, cut glass features, silverware, glass plateaus like the one you see in the uh, center of the dining table here at Dumbarton House, Argand lamp, uh, the uh, perfection of lamp technology to Im improve not only the uh, use of oil to maximize its use, but to amplify the brightness that it produced. Often furniture, woodwork, wallpaper, textiles were given uh, polished glossy uh, finishes not just to make them look uh, attractive or uh, uh, easier to clean, but to enhance their, excuse me, their appearance uh, by candlelight and lamplight. In the winter, families would uh, keep uh, to one room as opposed to spread across the room. Uh, they didn't have uh, clearly uh, cell phones uh, in each hand to uh, go into various corners to, uh, to read those. They stuck around into one room uh, and warmed that room. Use bed curtains to keep out drafts or cold air and to keep maintain body warmth in uh, cold chambers. The invention uh, of airtight stoves in the mid 19th century, certainly, well, early to mid 19th century, I guess, uh, certainly uh, improved the ability to heat rooms. 
recognizing uh, that the uh, movement of air across uh, fires and in fireplaces uh, diminished the ability uh, for the heat to uh, spread out across the room. Stoves used instead uh, of fireplaces or inserts into fireplaces uh, were more economical in the consumption of wood and coal, and these cast iron uh, stoves uh, uh, radiated heat to a much greater degree than uh, just uh, simply logs in the fireplace. You see a great example in the lower picture there of the Franklin stove uh, in uh, Dunbarton House uh, bed chamber. During the summer months, use of walkways took advantage of, uh, like I said, cross ventilation, terracotta tiles in kitchens, trying to reduce the heat produced by the ovens, uh, closed fireplaces in the summertime, Venetian shutters and linen shades shut out excess light yet provided ventilation when needed. Uh, you see the parlor there in the lower picture, Dumbarton House, we have uh, uh, shutters on those windows uh, that we use to from a uh, standpoint of not only uh, controlling heat, but controlling uh, the potential damage that light can occur uh, to historic objects. Uh, so we're doing a, a little bit of both in that. We're using historical features to produce and achieve modern results. Carpets placed down over wood floors in the fall and winter to uh, retain heat. Carpets turned over and rotated, so that sort of they wore evenly uh, in a room prolong their life. Cleaning was kept to a minimum to use uh, by using floor cloths, excuse me, uh, and uh, which made it much easier to cl uh, clean and protected the wood uh, floorboards. To protect against dust in the summertime, upholstered furniture is garbed in light cotton or linen covers, which is easily washed, cool to sit on, strategic placing of furniture to take advantage of natural light or light and heat from fireplaces, reusing old furniture, slip covering them uh, rather than uh, throwing them away, adding padding. Covers on dressing tables made from old materials used for beds, coverlets, petticoats. Great example of a uh, quilt in that uh, image right below, a posy quilt, part of the um, uh, Dumbarton House collection uh, is made up uh, from dress pieces from a, a dozen different uh, uh, women, including uh, Martha Washington and uh, uh, Eliza Custis. Things that we hold value in part of our collection are part of a reuse uh, process and sustainability. Of course, we're all familiar uh, with food and farming techniques uh, that uh, many of our ancestors used to uh, preserve food by smoking and drying and salting. I'm certainly not a recommending that uh, any of you go out and start smoking or drying or salting your own food, although I think that might be a worthy pastime. Leftover food scraps given to livestock or created our own uh, composting. Ice houses built into the side of uh, hills or uh, uh, next, to, uh, next to the houses uh, in uh, various locations, whether urban or uh, uh, farm, used windmills to power uh, mills. Compost, as I said, vegetable matter, manure, rotated crops to help uh, preserve and fertilize uh, the fields, different crops for different kinds of soils. All things that we sort of understand to a certain degree, but they're all sustainable activities that have taken place over time. Old materials used to make new ones, reuse. Curtains taken down seasonally to protect them from sunlight. Households adjusted living arrangements based on the seasons. Summer parlor, was larger, airier, lots of doors and uh, windows, and often lofty ceilings. Clothes were mended and adjusted to accommodate growing children. Again, this notion that uh, um, sustainability was based on uh, the reuse and repurpose of objects and materials. Use of natural materials, that of course, didn't have many in the, much in the way of synthetic materials available to them. That's a more 20th century phenomenon. They wrote on both sides of the paper and used letters uh, as the envelopes themselves. We're all familiar with that. Silver objects were melted down quite often and remade into new objects. Um, planted trees and cities had common parks, wore aprons over dresses to help keep them clean. Uh, techniques 
that were used not only to save materials, but actually what they did, the systems operations of the individuals. They made sure that they were working in a way to maintain uh, the objects that they prized and wanted to take care of. Now, if you indulge me for just one minute, let me uh, take a quick uh, uh, brief history of Dumbarton House. Built in 1799, uh, the earliest known photo we have is around uh, 1870. Uh, you can see that in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, sometime in the late 19th uh, century and uh, into the 20th century, it was uh, quote unquote Victorianized. Uh, it had been taken from its federal uh, period style uh, house uh, structure and appearance uh, to add to be more wedding cake in its appearance. There was a nice widow's uh, walk around the top, although how they got up there to walk around is uh, only uh, anyone's guess. Uh, the coins that you notice uh, on the corners of the buildings there were actually faux wooden uh, pieces uh, made to look like uh, cornerstones uh, for the house that were attached. Uh, and so we've got some images there, 1890 and then 1922, and it still has that sort of decorative element on it uh, that uh, is taken off uh, when the uh, dames purchase the house in 1928 and go through a restoration process uh, in 1930 and 31 before they reopen it as a uh, historic house museum and national headquarters. Uh, they hire uh, Horace Peasley, a renowned local architect in Washington, DC, uh, and um, Fisk Kimball, a, uh, a rather energetic and uh, busy uh, historic architecture uh, consultant and advisor, uh, who was also the director at the time of, uh, I believe, the Philadelphia Art Museum. Uh, to uh, help in the restoration of Dumbarton House. Uh, from the very beginning, even before they have a headquarters, the NSCDA is committed to historic preservation. Uh, and part of that uh, commitment uh, is, uh, whether purposefully or not, uh, is the embracing of sustainability, of holding on to what we have today, to have and present it to future generations, a worthy, uh, worthy process. As people interested in historic uh, house museums, we recognize the significance of historic preservation and our connection with sustainability over time. Historic preservation is a crucial part in creating sustainable environments and buildings. Preservation is about preserving the past for the future. Sustainability is about making sure what we have now is around for the future. Interestingly, I think I said this, uh, I may have mentioned this before, before 18 or 1920, typically more energy efficient than those built between 1920 and 2000. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how we can take some, all of us can take steps towards being sustainable at our sites in a very easy process to begin, and we'll talk some very fundamental things that you can do moving forward to make sure that you are doing the right things to be sustainable in your actions. As a historic site, be a leader and advocate for sustainable change in your work, your community, and the cultural field as a whole. Not just thinking of the house or the site, but the community that you live in and surrounds that site and also the community of professionals that you work with across your city, state, or the country. Be willing to change your habits and behaviors. Think outside the box on what your processes are to make sure that uh, excuse me, sustainable actions are an everyday part of your work and personal life. Three areas uh, that you should consider the interior, what's going on inside your building, actual functions within the building, but also the systems. The exterior, buildings and grounds, what's happening on the outside of your building, but also what's happening across the site and how your staff operates. 
one of the things, uh, first things that happened uh, at Dunbarton House uh, before the implementation of the, uh, the uh, passing and implementation of the uh, uh, sustainability action plan was to do a staff audit and to evaluate just how the staff operated uh, from everything, uh, from how the site and house were opened up in the morning uh, to what uh, uh, lights were turned on uh, and how they operated daily to find out where there were places that we could um, change to maximize our operations, but also lower costs. One thing, one great space, an area to start, is to examine your utilities. Send your bills to energy companies or energy suppliers and compare the rates. Gas, electric, trash removal, these are all commodities, uh, uh, processes sold, bought and sold. These prices fluctuate constantly. If we're thinking uh, clearly about each of the things that we have to rely on with respect to keeping our building systems functioning, we can save a great deal of money just by reevaluating these processes on a regular basis. We in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., for instance, uh, pay for our water uh, like anyone else, but we also have a sewage uh, a bill, a wastewater bill, uh, and it is built upon or applied based on the amount of hard surface that you have on your site. The more paved or hard surface that you have, the higher your bill is because water isn't absorbed through those features. It runs off and into the water, uh, 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 water sewers, and it uh, makes it difficult to uh, when large rains take place uh, for those systems to accommodate the huge amount of runoff from the city. And so the city is trying to, uh, or the district, I should say rather, uh, is trying to um, uh, uh, alleviate that and find out ways to accommodate that. If you can find ways to reduce the amount of hard surface, then you in DC uh, is, are going to save money. So there are things like that that you can look at uh, and examine. Some uh, free and easy things you can do uh, to starting out. If you're just starting out and trying to figure out what you want to do to be uh, more sustainable, reuse uh, packaging uh, materials. It seems like a no brainer, but uh, rather than throwing it, uh, throwing it away, find some space to be able to uh, save it. If you don't have the space, uh, return the materials to uh, a UPS store or FedEx store, whatever's in your na uh, neighborhood or community, uh, or if it's a, uh, locally run uh, business. They would uh, appreciate not having to spend their own money on styrofoam uh, and uh, other packing materials. Uh, it would then set you up again as a partner within the community uh, for businesses. Print double-sided or don't print at all. I think we have learned certainly over the past year and a half uh, that uh, printed materials aren't always that necessary. Uh, we can make do with a lot of uh, materials online and have. Um, I was looking this morning at the wonderful uh, uh, program for this, uh, this national conference uh, on my PDF document online, uh, not having to print it out. Reuse the backside of single-sided paper, either in printer as a, or a scrap paper. Um, think back to uh, uh, the uh, collections of the uh, early federal period and really beyond of uh, the cross-hatching that uh, people did on envelopes. Uh, and rethink and think of that in a modern uh, contemporary sense. Uh, limit uh, print materials and place information online. Some of this is uh, uh, as a result of the past year and a half, almost standard now. Um, maintain appropriate temperature uh, uh, thermostat settings on your uh, heating and air conditioning. Um, dispose of to uh, toxic uh, materials such as batteries and uh, fluorescent uh, bulbs and ink and toner cartridges. Uh, contact your trash, uh, your trash hauler uh, and see what uh, programs they might offer. Work with neighborhood, uh, uh, with your neighbors to see if there are uh, ways in which uh, you as an organization uh, can help uh, uh, assist them collecting and setting up uh, a recycling program. Donate equipment or materials no longer useful or uh, used by you, 
think of other local museum colleagues, uh, perhaps. Uh, they may uh, be able to use that desk or that uh, old printer that is of no use to you anymore. <clears throat> if you haven't already, sign up for online bills. I realize most people have already probably done this, uh, but I know we do still occasionally get a paper bill uh, from a uh, uh, service uh, organization. Try to reduce junk mail and multiple deliveries. You don't really need catalogs anymore, paper catalogs. I know sometimes it's nice to get them and look at them, uh, but in reality, all of that is available online and much more easily accessible. Institute a site-wide uh, recycling program. It's easy to do. Again, connect with your uh, local trash haulers. See how they are handling uh, recycling on their end. Uh, recycling too is a, a commodity of uh, materials that uh, is sometimes in great demand and sometimes not. Interestingly enough, glass is something that has become less uh, attractive from a recycling standpoint because of uh, the inability to sell the glass to, uh, uh, to end users or recyclers, I should say rather. Start a compost effort uh, at your, uh, your site. It's easy to do. We have a very small compost uh, bucket uh, outside our back door. Uh, it's uh, depending on how energized I am or lazy, I, depending on how you look at it. Uh, I dump that once a week or once in a, every two weeks uh, into our compost uh, pile at the uh, far edge of our property uh, where all our site leaves that get uh, raked and uh, gathered up go as well. Reuse plastic name badges. Uh, if uh, we had been fortunate enough to meet in person for this national conference, I would have been reusing uh, one of several name badges that I have that uh, I have used at other conferences uh, and, uh, and reused it again uh, after this national conference. So think in terms of that. Don't dispose of the ones you receive when you're at uh, uh, an event with a name badge. Make sure you turn it back in uh, or reuse it in some other way. From the grounds perspective, you can use a weed burner to remove weeds rather than using toxic chemicals. Uh, we have one in our garage that we use on occasion as well. Um, it's, uh, we don't have to worry about toxic chemicals being uh, uh, flushed into the water and out and uh, into our water system. Uh, we can go around. It does take time for someone to go around and burn the weeds, but that same person would have to go around and spray the weeds otherwise as well. So why not burn them? Purchase items for sale in your gift shop from American made or local resources. Uh, these local uh, businesses uh, need help just as we do. Uh, uh, try to promote them, see what they can produce or what they sell that you may be able to sell in your gift shop as well. I know we at uh, Dunbar and House uh, uh, try to uh, support local business as much as possible. We have coming up in the next couple of weeks a uh, maker's market that is uh, highlighting a, um, uh, over a dozen different local uh, retailers. Uh, and it is put on in conjunction with an exhibition that we have in Dumbarton House uh, called Making DC that highlights uh, manufacturers of uh, goods from writing desks and uh, uh, silver tea sets uh, to publications uh, that were produced during the federal period in uh, the DC area. So we connect history and we connect our exhibitions with actual uh, operations going on uh, on our grounds. Purchase items made from recycled materials or that can be recycled later or eco-friendly in some other way. Be cognizant and purposeful about what materials you use. Maintain uh, permeable surfaces. I told you the issue with uh, Dumbarton House, but it's also good because it allows the water to get back into uh, the ground system, the plants that we grow need. Have options for public transportation benefits for your employees and maybe your visitors. Think about how we can reduce that uh, huge carbon emission footprint from uh, transportation that takes place in this country. 
and also means lower costs. Add an option for online giving, something that I think most of us have already done. But if we are doing giving online, that means we don't have to print out uh, promotional materials. You can see it online. That means the dollars that you give go even more towards preservation efforts. Add rugs to the doorways to catch dirt as people enter. It's good not only from the standpoint of collecting dirt, but it can also be good uh, for trapping insects and uh, keeping those out of your uh, historic houses as well. Some other low cost solutions, use filtered water pitchers for the staff use. Uh, if you have uh, kitchenettes, uh, we have a water uh, filling station with a filter as well. Use real utensils uh, and uh, utensils, excuse me, and dishes instead of paper or plastic. I know paper and plastic seem extraordinarily convenient, uh, but the uh, uh, use of dishwashers, uh, particularly nowadays that are so efficient with the use of water, uh, we use far less water uh, with uh, washing uh, utensils and dishes uh, instead of uh, the amount of water that's used for paper or plastic uh, production of, of utensils. Um, I just noticed uh, you'll see our drawer of uh, silverware, uh, flatware in uh, the lower right hand corner. Uh, for some reason, there's a microphone in that drawer. I'm not really sure why. I probably should have cut that out of the picture. Um, purchase smart strips for computer workstations. There are great smart strips available right now that control uh, the um, use of electricity in a far more efficient way than they used to. Uh, there are ways that you can limit, uh, if you have to keep something plugged in, plug them into these smart strips. They limit how much electricity goes to those objects uh, that are plugged in all the time. Plant native plants uh, on your grounds. They're naturally adapted to the local environments, it's weather cycles, uh, and they look amazing. Uh, and it gives you something to, from an interpretive standpoint, to talk about with respect to uh, the plants that thrive uh, in your area. Replace bulbs uh, with LED light bulbs uh, as needed. Um, use sand uh, instead of, or mixed with uh, salt, ice melt during the winter. This is a great way to uh, save uh, in a variety of ways uh, by limiting the amount of salt, which is highly corrosive. You protect and preserve uh, the limestone or masonry uh, walkways that you might have at your property that uh, can uh, uh, really uh, uh, become uh, uh, destroyed with the use of, uh, of snow melt. Sustainability in collections. We all have collections. We all uh, uh, approach them uh, with respect to uh, um, uh, how are we going to take care of these, uh, again, to make sure they're here for a long time. We all use uh, the new nitro gloves, of course, now. Uh, recycle those. Uh, we belong to a nitro glove uh, uh, recycling uh, program. Uh, I also, when attending, uh, one of our local museum uh, consortium groups asked those other museums, all very small museums, to collect their gloves in between our meetings and bring them to the meeting for me to take and provide and be part of our glove recycling. Again, part of the community, building community connections within uh, or between uh, our museum colleagues. Reuse packing materials. Uh, uh, when uh, you are uh, able. Uh, sometimes it's not always uh, uh, best uh, practices or seen as best practices to reuse uh, materials, but if the uh, object is uh, safe and uh, uh, stable, there are sometimes uh, uh, materials that you can use, uh, reuse. Uh, and save scraps, they can be used for supports and other storage options. Limit long distance loans. Loans require a large outlay of resources, transportation, packing supplies, HVAC and other energy costs. Um, if it can be done with your own collection, then try and do it with your own collection. Rethink set points on the thermostat. None of us can live up to the old 5070 standard. Our historic houses, although well equipped to uh, uh, deal with environmental change, uh, cannot possibly 
uh, maintain that 50% humidity, relative humidity and 70 degree temperature set point. The amount of energy any of us would have to expend to maintain those uh, rigid standards uh, would, be, um, would not be cost effective in any way. And it's not necessarily always best for the collection. Think about your collection from the standpoint of the environment in which it lives. It's as local as you are. Your furniture is as local as you are and it has adapted over time. If it has sat in your uh, historic house's uh, living room for the past 90 years, it's kind of gotten used to the changes in, uh, in weather. So look to see what's happening with your collection and think in those terms. It'll cost less to be sustainable in that way. When thinking of construction projects, remember there's tons of construction waste that is uh, 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 created each year in uh, cities across this country. Think of sustainability as every aspect of the construction project. If you're looking to upgrade your HVAC, think of options. There's geothermal, of course, if you have a large site that might be beneficial and might work uh, from a uh, cost perspective. VRF, variable refrigerant flow, tends to be the standard nowadays. That's what uh, we have uh, upgraded to in 2017 at Dumbarton House. Um, preserve windows. Are storm windows a, a possibility, either internal or external at your historic site? Painting and stripping. Make sure you're following safety procedures when stripping paint. Many of the layers of paint that we uh, have on our historic houses have uh, uh, layers of lead-based paint. Be extraordinarily careful. Make sure you're talking to your contractors about these issues. And also conserve with respect to how you're doing these projects. If you know you have to preserve your windows, you know you have to do some painting and stripping, and you're looking to upgrade your HVAC at some time, See if there's a way that you can do all these at the same time. It's less stress on you, although you may not imagine that at the time, and less stress on the collection, which invariably would have to be moved and dealt with while these projects were going on. Institutionalize sustainability by creating a, st a sustainability action plan. Discuss green initiatives at board meetings. These are things that should be discussed. Sustainability is about protecting resources. It's also about saving money, the bottom line. We should talk as board meetings and staff members uh, about these issues. Tell people what you're doing. Create a sustainability uh, website uh, or web page uh, um, about what your actions are and what you're doing. Make it available for marketing sources to promote your green initiatives. If you promote them, it's not just about self-congratulation. It's about letting other people know what you're doing and making them, or helping them rather, see that these are actions that they can do as well. Apply for grants to research green initiatives. I'd like to take this time right now to congratulate McAllister House Museum that I had the pleasure of visiting more than a few years ago. Uh, having received uh, the uh, Great American Treasures uh, grant to uh, help support their initiative, Sustainability-Based Horticulture uh, Initiative. I think that's an amazing, an amazing program they're embarking upon. Congratulations to them. When starting preservation park projects, make sustainability an integral part of every discussion. How the contractor is going to dispose of the materials they're taking away, the scrap that is created from the construction, what are their processes? Work with them to find ways to be more sustainable, not only individually, uh, but as a community. Much of what I've talked about today is uh, uh, in part taken from uh, the Green Museum by Sarah Brophy and Elizabeth Wiley. Some of you may know uh, Sarah Brophy as Sarah Sutton. Uh, she's a phenomenal uh, uh, professional, has uh, worked at bringing sustainable plans and actions that fit cultural heritage organizations across this country. Uh, she's done some phenomenal work. Sustainable museums are community partners. If there's anything you take away uh, from this uh, 
uh, sort of rambling presentation I've given today is that sustainability is about building a community of which we are all a part. Sustainable efforts save you money. It may not seem it at first. Uh, there are certainly some actions that you have to take. You have to change the way you think about processes, but it ends up saving money in the long run. Sustainability also is a mission-driven action. Talk to your boards. Think about how sustainability can work for your institution. And integrate sustainable action with culture and systems of the museum. It's not just about talking about green. It's about how the systems of your museum, the actions that you do, can change to help you find ways to stop waste of money, time, enthusiasm, or resources. And please remember, sustainability, really like historic preservation, is a journey, not a destination. What you start today, others after you will build upon. We are learning new things every day and new processes that help us understand where we are in society and what we are uh, working to achieve. With that, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, what I've hit upon is just the very surface of sustainability and its connection with uh, historic preservation and community partnerships. Uh, there's a lot more uh, that can be done and talked about. Uh, and certainly some of you out there have probably already gone way beyond what I've mentioned here uh, and are achieving great things. But my email address is there as well as my phone number and extension. I'd be willing, more than willing to talk to anyone at any time about any of this. Um, thank you very much. Gary, thank you so much for your extremely relevant a presentation today. If you are okay and ready to open the floor to questions, we have uh, we have some questions for you. Absolutely. And, uh, to all of our participants, you can continue uh, adding questions into the chat box or the question and answer box. Uh, we have um, a little bit more time so we can dive even deeper if you have anything specific. So our first question uh, is, is there any hope that a geothermal heating or cooling might be a viable option for uh, historic sites, uh, given the exploratory work done uh, a decade or so ago? Uh, well, yes, I think actually it does. Uh, it would depend upon your individual site. Uh, you would have to uh, do some uh, uh, research to know whether the, uh, depending on how large your house is and how large your site is, whether you have the really sort of ground capacity uh, to uh, allow that uh, uh, process to work effectively, uh, but couple that also with the affordability and how, off, how long it would take you to um, recover basically the costs of installing a geothermal system. Geothermal systems are extraordinarily efficient and uh, uh, we were actually at Dunbarton House uh, looking to install a geothermal system when we were uh, looking to replace our HVA, uh, aging HVAC system. Uh, it didn't work out for us because of the uh, construction costs uh, that uh, were going to uh, uh, take place. Uh, just made it, uh, we could never have recouped uh, the money that it would have cost us to install it. Uh, but those were, uh, those cost problems were very localized uh, because of the amount of construction that was taking place in Washington, D.C. at the time. Uh, and because our project was on a scale of other projects relatively small, uh, most contractors didn't want to take on the effort. And so prices generally started to skyrocket as a result of the things that they would have to do to make it work at Dunbar and House. So there are still some issues with respect to cost effectiveness uh, in geothermal. Uh, but I'm still a big supporter of that, uh, of that system. It's a highly efficient uh, and age old system. Uh, we've been using geothermal ice houses uh, built by our ancestors are in fact a geothermal system uh, using the earth to uh, uh, keep the ice uh, um, uh, stored uh, for long periods of time, even throughout the summer. I think um, using the earth as a, an exchange for heat and cool is an amazing thing. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that 
question before we move on. Um, are there system designs that do both heating and cooling, or is it a kind of more directed to uh, one or the other? No, that uh, good question. Yes, most systems do both. Uh, so the variable refrigerant flow or VRF system that we have does both heating and cooling uh, for Dumbarton House. Uh, it's a uh, interesting, uh, that's an amazing sort of system as well because uh, it's designed to take uh, and look at your um, uh, house uh, as an example. Uh, as a unit made up of subunits. And as subunits heat or overheat or cool too much, it can borrow or add to different sections uh, in order to make the, uh, the heat more, uh, the heat or cool, the temperature, I should say, generally uh, um, equal across uh, all the zones. So that if you raise the temperature, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, it getting too hot in one area and too cold in another it tries to adjust based on the zones that you have set up. So it's, uh, there are some amazingly efficient systems out there today and doing both heating and cooling. Thank you. And moving on. So do you have any advice, Jerry, on how to evaluate sustainable investment strategies for the uh, endowments? Wow, that is a great question. And uh, I don't think I am qualified to answer that. I think that is an amazing question. And I think that is something we should probably look at. Uh, that's something that uh, the more, how should I put this? Investment intelligent people that are part of the NSCDA could probably answer better than I could. Thank you. Um, continuing on, uh, another question from the chat box. Are there any studies that you would recommend which discuss uh, protocols relating to more uh, location-specific heat and humidity, environmental controls, you know, rather than the traditional 5070, which you mentioned sure. uh, is not the way to go anymore? Sure, absolutely. Uh, there's actually a publication uh, produced by the Institute of... Uh, uh, Institute of... Uh, what is it? IPI, photographic, uh, um, their name has now escaped me. Uh, it'll come, it'll pop into my head in just a second here. Uh, but they've produced a great uh, uh, document on uh, how to think of and talk about, particularly to uh, contractors, uh, the needs uh, that you have based on your particular locality. They have a great uh, uh, image permanence institute. I told you it would come to me. Uh, have produced several documents on uh, HVAC uh, and temperature and humidity uh, uh, controls and requirements, whether you're in Phoenix, Arizona, or uh, Seattle, Washington, or Washington, DC, uh, the differences and needs with respect to both the controls, uh, but also with respect to sort of the set points uh, that you might wanna consider uh, for monitoring both uh, um, uh, temperature and humidity uh, are clearly laid out, but that's a great, uh, that's a great resource uh, to look at. And uh, further resources to provide for everyone. Um, do you know or have um, lists of good vendors for sustainable museum supplies? Yeah, that's, uh, that's always a tough one. Uh, right, uh, because uh, sustainable uh, sustainability has always been a um, noble dream, I guess you might say, of, uh, of collections management, in particular museum work. We tend to not want to uh, um, hurt our objects in any way by introducing foreign objects that we're not sure about. And when things, when you start to do reuse things or recycle things, we tend to worry whether or not they are uh, quote unquote clean enough for us to use in collections. And so it's always uh, extraordinarily difficult. Um, I think it's, uh, I have no particular resource uh, to provide people with respect to, uh, uh, to that. Um, um, as a, I mean, as far as suppliers go, I think you need to uh, talk to the existing suppliers, 
uh, Gaylord, uh, Hollinger, uh, people like that. Uh, uh, and to get a sense, uh, talk to the sales rep. They're more than willing to uh, talk to you um, and, um, and find out uh, you know, what they can do or what are they doing to provide uh, um, uh, sustainable products. All right, well, that is all of the questions that I am currently seeing. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jerry. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time. And um, like I said, if there are any further questions, please, uh, please let me know. <laughs>